the syracuse. I don't know how, but and uh, he also uh, part on the project also worked in the syracuse university. Uh, so that's uh, and he graduated uh, as BS from Caltech. Okay, so now we know his credentials. Right. So as a token of of appreciation from the department. in the 
this phase, and I can talk about the phase of this field, and I can look at the phase of this field winding around this hole. And for the field to be single value, the phase has to come back to itself modulo 2 pi. And so that gives us different options. It can come back to itself exactly, or it can come back plus 2 pi, minus 2 pi, and so on. And those are all topologically distinct states, and there's no way for me to continuously deform one field into a different topological state. Even without such a hole, if we do the standard theorist trick of assuming periodic boundary conditions, then a rectangle becomes the surface of a torus, and we can talk about the lining of a field around each of its two axes. So what we're going to see later is these two components give us two components of a vector that we call the topological polarization. <coughs> and finally, if we're talking about mechanical systems, sometimes our field can just be a solid object. So I can talk about the winding of one loop around another. So if I have a winding where they do close around one another, that's a distinct topological state from when they aren't closed around each other. So that's going to give me a chance to give you a very trivial definition of topological protection and how it can be robust and useful in a system I think we're all familiar with. So this is a bicycle at a bike rack. This is the same system, but it's in a slightly different state. If you look closely at the frame of the bicycle and the bike lock, on the left we have that the bicycle is properly secured to the bike rack. But on the right, someone has messed up a bit, and the bike lock is only lying on top of the bicycle frame. It's not actually looped through it. So these are two different topological states. So we want to apply some sort of probe to the system. And for this system, we can do that just by leaving it uh, out overnight on a busy street. And we can think about what's going to happen to the system in the two different states. And on the left, you can have a great deal of force applied to the system, and it will still remain in the same topological state. On the right, you can come back the next morning and realize that you left your bicycle in a state that was topologically equivalent to the vacuum. <laughs> so this is literally topological protection. It's robust and useful. Um, what we're going to see is similarly robust and useful. It's just that it's going to be a momentum space, so I can't actually show you the lock showing you that there's two different states. But we're going to do just that. And we're going to see that it's protected in the sense that we can't get from one to the other without breaking something. And that breaking something we're going to call making a critical lapse. So moving on to a more non-trivial system, when we think of topological states as physicists, we usually uh, default to thinking of topological insulators. So what this is, is a quantum mechanical system with electronic modes and crystalline order. And the modes don't have to have interactions, they don't have to uh, be coupled together strongly. Um, but we see a phenomenon that is an insulating bulk and protected edge modes. The edge is conducting, the bulk is insulating. And the theory that we come up with to explain this is that there's a topological invariant that creates these protected modes and use them with special properties. So then that leads us to ask, what about other crystals? So there are other systems that have crystal in order and have different degrees of freedom and obey different equations. So this obeys Schrodinger's equation. We can have classical systems that obey Newton's equation. And we can say, in these classical systems, do they have topological insulator states? Or do they have new topological states that don't even have electronic elements? If the answer were no, this would be a very short talk. Um, instead, let me briefly survey some of the systems that people have looked at that are not electronic, but do have topologically non-trivial states. So you can have photonic crystals, okay, very similar to normal topological insulators, the difference being that their edge modes are light, not electrons. You can have acoustic systems where your degrees of freedom are pressure waves in air moving through the pipes. And you can show that based on the uh, way the pipes are connected and their geometry, that you can have topologically non trivial states in this system. You can have an optomechanical system that couples light and mechanical elements together. You can have spin systems. So this is a highly frustrated antiferromagnet where all the spins are affected by the orientation.
applications and their neighbors. And this, you can show, is actually equivalent to the folding of an origami sheet. And both of them have topological properties. Uh, you can have biological microtubules. So this is a biological system that has uh, two stable states. So it's bistable, two states uh, that are related to each other by mirror symmetry. And the authors here associate those two states with two different values of a topological invariant. We can keep going. You can have pendulums coupled together. So a pendulum, classical harmonic oscillator, coupled to each other by uh, simple springs. And if you have two classical degrees of freedom, you can make that look like a spin degree of freedom. So this system actually maps directly onto a quantum spin hall system. Then you can ask what happens if you explicitly break time reversal symmetry. So for most of the talk, I'm going to regard that as cheating, and I'm going to take systems that do obey Newton's equations, uh, where you have acceleration proportionate to force. Um, for these, each site is actually a constantly spinning gyroscope. And systems of gyroscopes, they have a velocity that's proportionate to the force on them. So this actually obeys an equation that looks very much like Newton's equation. And then what you have is, with this time reversal symmetry breaking, you can have one chiral edge mode. So anytime you give a kick to this system, you get a perturbation that travels clockwise around the exterior of the system. So that's, that's the only low energy mode per minute. You can have origami systems. So this origami system can be mapped directly onto the sushi for heater model of polyacetylene. And what it tells you is that you have two topologically distinct states, and one of the states corresponds to the left edge being soft, having a floppy mode, and the other one corresponds to the right edge being soft. And finally, you have rigid frameworks of the kind I'm going to be focusing on today. So these are a very simple physical system, but as we'll see, they have a lot of decidedly non-trivial topological effects. So this is a system of rigid triangles connected by hinges. And it has a quantity that we'll define later called topological polarization. And it couples to that defect there, the orange and green triangles. And you either localize the zero mode or you don't, depending on the value of the topological polarization. So now, mechanisms. So as I'm using the term, I'm talking about large zero energy deformations of otherwise rigid structures. And we use them all the time to transform force and motion. So if you have a robot arm or a human arm, you have certain motions about joints that cost very little energy. But on the other hand, you have certain motions along the arm where it can sustain a great deal of force. So that's a useful way of transforming force and motion. Another classical example is a water wheel, where you have this lateral motion of the flow of the water turned into a spinning motion by the water wheel, very useful to perform work. You can have mechanisms that raise and lower drawbridges, control human traffic. So there are uncountable mechanisms in our lives and in nature, but none of the ones I've shown you uh, are topological or are even necessarily particularly interesting to physicists. So how do we bring these two things together? When we bring them together in this really surprisingly simple system. So I'm going to be talking about mechanical systems that we can think of as a bunch of balls connected by springs. So this site has no internal degrees of freedom. All it can do is move left, right, move up, down. And if we're in three dimensions, it can move forward and back as well. And the way these sites interact is that they have springs connecting some of them. So these bonds will take to be simple springs, meaning that to compress or extend them costs energy but that there's no energy to rotate the bonds about a site in a way that doesn't stretch any of them. And when I draw this, I usually just draw in the triangle rather than drawing in all the bonds and sites. So I'm going to show you some very simple prototypes, but what we're really envisioning is something that is experimentally realizable today on a much smaller scale. Uh, 
real energy to hinge them relative to compressing them. Uh, and there are lithographic techniques that can give us these systems down to 10 microns. So this is a polymer-based material. It's a little hard to see here, but it has a bow tie shaped cell, or also called a reentrant hexagon. And this is a configuration of the lattice that's associated with the negative Poisson's ratio. When you compress this, instead of spreading out left to right and widening in the other dimension, it actually shrinks in the other dimension as well. So this is a bit limited right now. You can't necessarily make it too thick, and you can't necessarily make too much of it. But self-assembly has the promise of making larger bulk material. So again, operating at the level of tens of microns, you can uh, try to self-assemble these structures. And this is a difficult self-assembly project in that if you look at these, they have lots of open spaces between the bonds. So you need a type of particle that will bond in some places, but will leave open areas in other places. So these particles only bond together along the black patches. They're repulsive along the white bands. So they form a cavity lattice, where three of them stick together in a triangle, triangles stick together, but they leave open pores in between. <clears throat> so you can make a regular cavity lattice with these now, and we're looking at ways to make irregular cavity lattices of the type we need to get topological polarizations. So um, I promise I won't have too much math, but we're uh, entering the thicket a bit here. So the basic uh, mathematical object that we use to describe this system, rather than a Hamiltonian, is something that's actually a, a little more fundamental to the system than a Hamiltonian. And what it is, is called a rigidity matrix, where if I tell you the equilibrium position of all these sites, and I tell you which sites are bonded together with each other, and then I tell you how much I displace each site from its equilibrium, then you can tell me how much I extend each bond. That's just simple geometry. And that geometry is represented in an object that we call the rigidity matrix. So the rigidity matrix is applied to a vector of site displacements, and it gives out the vector of bond extensions. I could also say that I have tension in my bonds. And then I could ask you, what is the force on each site? And then the force on each site is just the sum of the tensions projected along the length of the bonds. So it turns out that the matrix that relates the vector of bond tensions to the vector of forces on sites is just the transpose of the rigidity matrix. So the fact that the same matrix uh, controls both displacement and force is going to give us a type of index theorem. And this index theorem has a long history. It goes back to Maxwell of electrodynamics fame who, writing in 1864, was concerned with figuring out whether or not bridges would fall over. And what he realized is that if you have a site, then it has some number of degrees of freedom, two in two dimensions. And then as you keep adding in bonds, you keep taking away degrees of freedom. So he realized that the number of zero modes could, at most, be the number of site degrees of freedom, minus the number of bonds. And he was aware, but he didn't really deal mathematically with the notion that some bonds could be redundant. And Caledon, writing over 100 years later, uh, improved this. And he said that you can have redundant bonds, but redundant bonds generate self-stresses instead of zero modes. And a zero mode is a displacement without an extension of any bond. A self-stress is its ante. It is a set of tensions without any force. And what you can see here is that they always come in pairs. If I want to bring in another zero mode, I have to bring in another self-stress. And the difference between them is actually the topological index. So let's see an example of that. So the framework I have there is rigid. I can't shear any of these things in two dimensions. But what if I take the same number of bonds and I move them around? Now, it's not rigid anymore. I can shear the top square. Remember, there's no energy cost to changing bond angles, only bond lengths. But the cost is that when I moved the bond into the lower square, now I have a self-stress. Now I can pull inward with the cross beams, push outward with the outer beams, and I'll generate no net force. So this is a trick we're going to come back to again and again, which is that if we want to create zero modes, or if we want to move them around, then we need to 
do so, but only if we do them in conjunction with self stresses. What we're doing mathematically is we're splitting the dynamical matrix. So if I think about Hamiltonian mechanics, what I need to know is I need to know the energy in terms of the state of the system, which is given by the set of displacements. And if all the bonds are simple springs, then the energy is just one half the sum of the spring extensions, which we can write in terms of the Judy matrix, which means that the dynamical matrix, which gives us the forces in terms of the displacements, could be constructed from the rigidity matrix. So we could just stop there and do dynamics. But the problem with that is that I want to distinguish between two cases. And there are two kinds of equilibrium states. One equilibrium state is a zero mode, where I don't stretch any of the bonds, cost zero energy. Another state is a self-stress, where I, for a 1D chain, I can just compress the whole thing that's still an equilibrium state because the forces from the springs all cancel out in the interior. But I've added a lot of energy to the system, I'm applying a lot of force to the boundary. So physically those are quite different. But if all I do is look in the null space of the dynamical matrix, I won't be able to distinguish between the two. So I really need a more fundamental object, which is given by this so-called quantum Hamiltonian, which has the rigidity matrix and our hands both separately. And if I square this quantum Hamiltonian, I could get the dynamical matrix back, along with this thing, which is its supersymmetric partner, but we don't worry about that. Uh, but what this really tells me is that I can keep this, and I can look for the zero modes and the self-stresses separately. So um, this is the mathematical object that we map onto a quantum Hamiltonian. It's not the class of Hamiltonian, so they don't have the same dynamics. But a zero mode of this is a zero mode of the class of Hamiltonian. So this will tell us where the zero modes are, and it is equivalent to the uh, quantum Hamiltonian of an electronic band structure, such as a topological insulator. And in particular, we're going to focus on isostatic, or Maxwell lattices. And these are lattices with an equal number of modes and constraints. So in 2D, each site has two degrees of freedom. So it has four bonds coming out of it, but each bond is split between two sites. And that's two sites bonds with two degrees of freedom. So that means we have just enough constraints to take away all of our zero modes, assuming we have no redundancies. So the two we're focusing on are the deformed square lattice, which has the bond topology of the regular square lattice and the deformed Kaganian lattice, which has the bond topology of the Kaganian lattice. But in each case, we're changing things. So we're choosing springs of different lengths so that we don't have any straight lines. And that's going to be important for generating topologically non-trivial states for breaking those symmetries. So when we have a lattice like this, the only way to get a zero mode is to remove some of the bonds, which we have essentially done by choosing a finite lattice with open boundary conditions or by generating self-stresses. So again, from our index theorem, we can create zero modes as long as we do them in conjunction with self-stresses. So now I want to specialize in the case of biolattices. So remember now we're talking about isostatic lattices with bonds missing at the boundary. So our index theorem says that each bond we cut generates a zero mode. And naively, what we would think is that when we cut those bonds at the boundary, we generate zero modes at the boundary. And indeed, that naive assumption is often correct. But we're going to show you a special type of lattice where that fails, where I can cut bonds at the boundary, and instead of creating a surface mode that only lets me wiggle some small sliver at the surface, we're actually going to be able to push that mode into the bulk and use that to actually animate the bulk, to take a system that has a mechanically rigid bulk and create a system that has an instability. As we're going to see, this is a special type of instability. It's not seen in linear elasticity. It's going to be assigning soidal instability at finite wave numbers. So we're getting a little back into the math here. Um, but if we think about the modes of our system, the usual thing we do for a mechanical system, if we're doing something like acoustics, is 
is look at phonon modes. So we have a set of displacements that is going to vary sinusoidally along some direction. And if we have a mode like that, we can obtain its frequency and its energy. So we get some dispersion relationship. Omega, the frequency, is a function of k, the wave number. What we're going to look for, though, is a slightly wider class of zero modes. So we want to look for both bulk modes like this, but we also want to look for edge modes. And the reason we choose modes like this is because they are normalizable in infinite lattices and other periodic boundary conditions. But we want to talk about finite lattices with open boundary conditions. So there, it's permissible to have modes with a more general form, where instead of multiplying by a phase factor each time we move over a lattice site, we're multiplying by a general complex number. It can be more or less than one. So this is a family of modes that includes edge modes that are growing or shrinking as we move along lattice structures. So if z1 equals 2, if we have a mode in this cell, it's going to be twice as big here, twice as big here, twice as big here. So it's going to be exponentially localized on the right wall. z1 equals a half, it's going to be exponentially localized on the left wall. So then our all conditions are just that z1 and z2 both have unit magnitude, so that they're neither growing nor shrinking as we move through the lattice. So, topological polarization. We're missing bonds at every edge, but it turns out that extra modes aren't always where the bonds are missing. So what we have is a topological polarization vector in general, I'll come on in the next slide. But physically what it is, is a vector that points along a lattice direction, that points towards a direction with excess surface bonds. So, if the topological polarization is zero, then the fact that we made cuts on the left and the right means that we'll have zero modes on the left and the right. But if the topological polarization points to the right, what, what's there, what that is reflecting physically is a lattice which has both families of zero modes on its right edge and has no families of zero modes on its left edge. And this is determined by the winding of the phase field, which means it's topologically protected. It's not something that we can turn on and off arbitrarily only by undergoing certain specific deformations. So here's the last real bit of math. Let's get it out of the way. What we're looking for is a system with zero modes. And they can be edge modes. And this is our rigidity matrix. This is the fundamental object in our system. And if it has a zero mode, it has a zero eigenvalue, which means that it's a zero determinant. So what we're doing is we're looking for values of z1 and z2, the generalized uh, wave number, that give us the zero mode. So I'm looking for the z1 and z2 corresponding to a zero mode, even if it's an edge mode. And the fundamental theorem of algebra tells us that this is going to find all the modes we've got from cutting each bond of the boundary. So we can turn this into an algebraic equation in the rigidity matrix. So we're looking for these zeros. If we look in the complex plane of z1. So this axis is the real part of z1. This is the imaginary part. This can have, for example, two solutions. So the solution in the unit circle corresponds to a zero mode on the left wall. Outside the unit circle corresponds to one on the right wall. And the interesting thing mathematically about this, and this is the same logic as in topological insulators, is that if we look at the winding of the phase field along the unit circle, this will tell us how many zeros we have in the unit circle. Maybe they're both in there, maybe one's in there, maybe neither is in there. In each case, what we're going to get is a different value of the winding of the phase field. So this phase field is the phase of that determinant of the rigidity matrix. So if we look at how that phase winds as we move through the bulk modes by 2 pi, that gives us the number of zero modes on the left wall or on the lower wall. Physically what this is, is that the winding of the phase field of the bulk bands across the Brio zone gives us the location of the zero edge modes, even though the edge modes aren't the bulk modes. So there's a bulk boundary correspondence. So this is what that looks like uh, physically. So what I'm doing here is instead of choosing a mode and finding its frequency, I'm choosing one part of the mode, I'm 
choosing the value kx of the wave number, and I'm sol solving for the ky part that gives me a zero. And I'm always going to get solutions in these isostatic lattices. For a fully stable lattice with a lot of extra bonds, I won't always get such solutions. But for these lattices, I'll always get zero modes, and I'll solve for kappa y. If kappa y is positive, then I have a zero mode that's growing as I move in this direction, so it's a zero mode on the top. If it's negative, then I have a zero mode on the bottom. So this is a plot of the inverse decay length kappa y as a function of kx. What I see is two bands that have kappa y equals zero only at kx equals zero. Those two bulk zero modes correspond to the two translations of the system, moving left, right, and moving up, down. Everything else is an edge mode. We have kappa y positive, that's the zero modes on the top edge. Kappa y negative, zero modes on the bottom edge. So this is the topologically trivial state. This is uh, just what we would expect naively, which is that we have zero modes on the top and the bottom, precisely because we made cups on the top and the bottom. So now we want to figure out how can we do something unnatural? How can we move the zero modes to different edges? And the solution is to create a critical lattice. So we're going to choose a different point in parameter space, a different lattice. We're going to choose one with straight lines of bonds. So I have straight lines of bonds. That means I can put tension in each of these bonds without generating any net force. So that's a self-stress. So I have self-stresses all throughout the bulk of my lattice now. And if you remember from our index theorem, self-stresses compare to zero modes. That means that I also have zero modes in the bulk. So what I'm doing here is exactly the same as cutting through that loop. So the whole thing only worked because I didn't have any zero modes in the bulk, that I had a bulk insulator, a mechanical insulator, meaning that it was rigid. And now what I'm creating is a bulk conductor, something that's floppy in the bulk. And we can see that that inverse decay light that used to be positive is now zero. Those zero modes that were on the top edge are now in the bulk. Now I just have to keep going past this point in parameter space. So keep going from starting off at the sites to the left of the straight line. Now I can carry them over to the right of the straight line. And this is the polarized lattice. So this lattice looks pretty much the same to the naked eye. I couldn't tell the difference between them side by side. But if I do the math, and I solve, and I find the inverse decay lengths, then what I've found is that instead of having zero modes on the top and on the bottom, I have both families of zero modes are on the bottom edge. So now, I've made cuts to the top and the bottom, but only the bottom is not on all the zero modes. So this is topological polarization. And this is quite nice for manipulating the edge. But we want to go beyond that if we can. We want to say, can we take these zero modes, can we preserve the topological protection, but can we uh, push them into the bulk? And the critical lattice are in the bulk, but only because we have these exact straight lines, which are uh, impossible to actually generate. We can go from one side or the other to the critical lattice, but it requires fine-tuning every side perfectly to get exactly on it. But is there a way to take some of those zero modes and keep them in the bulk? To create a system where, despite looking at it, looking at it locally and saying that it should be mechanically rigid in the bulk, can we actually create an instability? So what we're looking for we call vial modes. This is an analogy with vial semi-metals, electronic systems. So now what we're looking for is a bulk mode, no kappa y now, no kappa x. It's a bulk phonon that's neither growing or shrinking in magnitude. But we're looking for the situation where the frequency exactly vanishes. So both modes with zero energy and zero frequency. So we're looking for kx and ky to be finite. Of course, this would be satisfied if kx and ky are equal to zero, because we have modes of translation. Uh, and what we find is that we can, in fact, do this. And we get a vial wave number that is incommensurate and adjustable. So this is the Brillouin zone. This is applied to the function of kx and ky, and the dark areas are low or zero frequency modes. So we have some low frequency modes coming off of the origin here. We'll talk more about these soft modes later. But what we also have is a finite wave number, kx and ky, and then at its opposite wave number, we have two zero modes. We have these vial modes. So what are the lattices that have these modes? Well, when we go back to 
the deformed Kagan lattice, which was the first lattice that was shown to be topologically polarized. It never contains five points. So we're looking at this, wondering if we need to create some special symmetry, break some special symmetry. Uh, we know what Hamiltonian we want. How do we get it? And it turns out that we don't need any special symmetry. We don't need any fine tuning. All we needed to do was to try to square lattice. And when you try to square lattice, you find that it can't contain a pair of vial points. And the secret, as mundane as it is, is that the square lattice just has a broader parameter space. It has four sites instead of three sites. You just have more options, more things you can do. And you can keep going. You can keep making more and more complicated lattices. And so if you have a lattice with 100 sites, you can have 50 pairs of vial points. So the more complicated you make your lattices, the more, more vial modes you have. They're generic for these two-dimensional uh, mechanical lattices. So in fact, if you think you're making a nice aesthetic point, uh, you need to be worried about these points. You need to be worried about vial points because if you don't choose carefully, you'll have them by accident. So let's think back to our topology. Our topological polarization was looking at the winding of a number uh, across the freedom zone under periodic boundary conditions. But now we have a point, a wild point is a point where the phase field vanishes because the determinant vanishes, so if it's zero, it doesn't have a phase. And now we can look at the winding of the phase field around the zero mode. And again, we have a finite number. So we have this finite number for a wild point that's always plus or minus one. And there's a symmetry protection that says if it's plus one for one vial point, it has to be minus one for the other. And this means that they're protected. That if I deform the lattice a little, I can't remove this vial point. It's guaranteed to be there. All I can do is move it around. Which, of course, raises the question, how did it get in there in the first place? So vial points can be created and destroyed, but only in pairs. If I have a plus one vial point, it has to pop into existence with a minus one vial point at the same point. So that the total winding number at that point doesn't change. So you can have a pair of vial points, and they appear at the origin and spread out. And when they do, they always do so along one of these soft directions. Normally, for an elastic material, what you have is that your frequency in the long wavelength limit goes like the wave number k. These soft modes are special. They're a characteristic of these isostatic regular lattices. And they have a softer dispersion. They have frequency going like k squared. And these soft modes don't guarantee that you have vowel points. The deformed Kagame, for example, has soft modes with no vowel points. But they are a necessary condition. When vowel points do appear, they appear along one of these soft modes. So if we take this vowel lattice and we keep changing its unit cell, We'll get back to this point, which is the point where the vial points have broken off in the soft direction and are now visible as distinct features in the freedom zone. Now we want to know where they're going. What happens if we keep deforming the lattice? Well, if we deform it in a certain way, of course, we can bring them back to the origin and they can cancel out. But that would be a bit disappointing. And it turns out that there's one other thing that they can do that will end up being important. They can also vanish at a different time reversal symmetry point they can vanish at the corners. So this point and this point are actually the same point, because remember, we have periodic boundary conditions in both directions. So the vial points can make it to the corners, and they can cancel out with each other again, and then we're left again with a stable non vial lattice. So let's look at what was happening in terms of the edge modes. So I did not invoke the edge before, and in fact, you don't need an open edge to have these vial points. If you have periodic boundary conditions, and you'd sell vial points. And from our index theorem, if we did that, they compared with vial self stresses, which would mean a sinusoidally varying self stress. But we can also think of a lattice with open boundary conditions, so that we do have edge modes. So let's go back and look. Remember, positive kappa y means an edge mode on the top edge, negative on the bottom edge. So this is the point we saw a couple slides ago where vial points are just appearing at the origin. Now we can see these here as places where the band crosses capital Y equals zero. So every point on that blue line is a zero mode, but they are all bulk modes. But they 
across kappa y equals zero, that's the bulk mode, that's the vial mode. If we keep deforming the lattice, the span keeps lowering, and its crossing point keeps moving. And you can see from this that the vial points are topologically protected. If I deform the lattice, I deform this blue line, but I can't take away this crossing. This crossing is just going to move left or right. And if I keep going, it'll keep coming down, it'll keep coming down, and eventually at pi, it can go away. So if I keep deforming the lattice, I get to the point here where I've topologically polarized the lattice. Two families and zero modes on the bottom edge, none on the top. So I've found a way now to topologically polarize the lattice without ever going to the critical point. So now I want to put that all together in the phase diagram. There was a lot going on there, so I have to give you a sort of ugly, complicated phase diagram. So what we've got is we have four sites. So we have a wide parameter space. So to simplify things as much as we can, I picked three of the sites in the lattice. And these are the same sites shifted over by a lattice primitive vector. And each point on this phase diagram corresponds to a place that I can put in the fourth site. So I can put in the fourth site, like in that inset, and then I can put in all the bonds between them. And then I can ask, is the lattice vial or non-vial? Is it critical or non-critical? Is it polarized or non-polarized? White areas are non-vial. They do not have this finite wave number instability. The blue areas are vital points. In the white areas, we can have topological polarization. This is zero topological polarization. Otherwise, we have vectors indicating the direction of topological polarization. And then finally, the black lines are critical lattices. So the first thing to note here is that the critical lattices do require finding. If I just throw a dart, at this phase diagram, I'm never going to hit a critical point. But if I throw a dart at this phase diagram, I'm pretty likely to hit the blue area. I don't need any fine tuning to get a vial out of this. The other thing is, once again, if I cross the critical line, I change the topological polarization. I change from having a topological polarization here, cross the line, I don't have topological polarization. But I can have the same effect without hitting any of those critical lines but instead going through a vial lattice. So I have a topological polarization here. I go here, the vial points have entered the bulk. I keep going, they're moving across the bulk. Now they've disappeared at the corner, and now the topological polarization has changed. In fact, both components have changed because the vial points went diagonally across the bulk. This is a snapshot of a vial point. These are generic or sufficiently complex lattices. The lattice is Eight gray lines underneath this. The red arrows are the direction of the phonon mode. And again, this is a mode that costs zero energy. And it's not decaying as I move away from the edge. What you can see instead is that it's sinusoidally varying. And it's varying in this direction and over about eight or nine cells. So it's not going in a lattice direction. And it's not going over a lattice length scale. It's something new. It's something emergent. It depends on the interactions between many cells. This is, again, topologically protected. I'm not doing any fine-tuning, and I can't remove it except by going to zero or pi, or by doing something that breaks the symmetry or adds in bonds. And what it gives me is a sinusoidal elastic instability and an incommensurate wave number. And if you know how you do normal elasticity, you look at the long wavelength limit of the dynamical matrix. So this would be completely missed by that. But it exists nevertheless. It's something that is not long wavelength, but is low energy. Come on. And, this, Come on. and this is a plot of the band dispersion. So this is in Kx and Ky, these are the frequencies. And you can see the vial points visible as crossings of the bands at zero frequency. So now I want to move on to the final part of my talk, which is the effect and application of global mechanisms. So, Previously, we were looking at how to choose lattices with certain properties, how to program in a particular operated lattice, especially the vial model. Now I want to talk about lattices where instead of choosing a property beforehand, I can actually change the properties of the lattices. So I'm going to show you a way that we can do this without applying any stress. And this is possible because we have these very unstable lattices that have lots of zero modes. And as we're going to see, we can actually use this to tune between different topological states. And this 
has uh, interesting physical consequences. So I want to proceed by showing you a video that kind of throws all these things together, and then I'll spend the rest of the time uh, decomposing what's going on in this video. So we're talking about transformable. We're going to see how to transform the properties. Topological, we've talked about that. Mechanical metamaterials. Metamaterials because this is a property that you don't see in conventional materials. Uh, the fourth thing here, uh, Sean Mao Zhao, the undergrad in our group. So here we go. Uh, we are, I should say, everyone, every name on this collaboration is a theoretical physicist. Uh, and we actually tried to build something this time. So we're using a literal toy model. So we built this out of connects. Um, and we've created a deformed Kagame lattice. And what we have is a hard triangle like this. And you can't see it too well, but they're either blue or black hinges. So it has literal free hinges, allow the whole thing to rotate. And uh, so again, we have a finite isocyte lattice. We've made cuts at the boundaries, we're missing modes. So what happens when I press on it is that I can deform it for no energy. And you can see, even though we've been talking about linear effects, this works well into the nonlinear regime. Uh, we've made cuts at the top too, they're missing bonds at the top. So I can go around and I can do the same thing. There's an insula at the top. Now what we're going to do is we're going to transform the lattice. We're going to give it a new property, and we're not going to do it by reconstructing the thing, snapping off a lot of pieces and creating an entirely new lattice. What we're going to do is we're going to pull on the edges, and we have metal frames inserted into the edges here. And as you can see, the lattice is actually expanding. We're keeping more or less the same crystalline order, um, the same periodicity, but we're changing the lattice factors. It's expanding effect. So these are the straight lines. Remember, straight lines give us self-stresses, which give us zero modes, which allow us to change the topological polarization. So theoretically, if you look at the geometry, we just changed the topological polarization of this lattice by tugging on the edges. And I should note one other thing again that we did as theoretical physicists. We created a lot of disorder purely by the fact that uh, we were putting some torque on the metal rods and we were pulling on them, and things were lifting up a little into the third dimension. So if you measure those angles carefully, they would not all be quite the same angle. So there is now, whether we want to or not, a fair amount of disorder in this lattice because we did not control it very well. So now the question is, are we going to see any effect uh, like our theory predicted, or are we going to find that it really takes something quite a bit more sophisticated and controlled? So does anyone want to hazard a guess as to what's going to happen when I push on this lattice again? Let's watch. were identical, uh, I mean the structure were identical on two sides? Uh, they are identical, but there's no reflection symmetry, so the, the sides are definitely different, they have different mechanical properties, um, but they are different in the sense of one of them having more bonds than the other, or one of them having more bonds than they did before. So the whole point of choosing the deformed Kagame is that now we don't have any reflectional or rotational symmetry, so they're allowed to be different. It's just that if I asked you to guess, you have to admit you would have guessed that one of them was completely floppy and one of them was completely rigid. So this is the mode that we used. So we call it a global mechanism because we're doing the same thing to every cell. And if you have isostatic lattices, they always have a global mechanism. It's often called a guess mode. I forgot guess and from 2003. And essentially, you make another sort of counting argument like Maxwell did, except now you're applying it to the whole lattice, treating it as forcing the crystalline symmetry. So for the Kagame lattice, you can have this thing where you twist each triangle and it collapses in on itself. 
But again, this is only for the isostatic lattice. So there's no guarantee that if you have another type of lattice, so this is an open lattice, but it's corner sharing quadrilaterals. And if you try to compress this without stretching any bonds, without deforming any of the quadrilaterals, you can't do it. But if you choose corner sharing quadrilaterals with a special symmetry, which for this means that all the quadrilaterals have to be the same parallelogram, all the orange ones are the same parallelogram, all the blue ones are the same parallelogram, then you do have a global elastic instability. So you can look for lattices that are not necessarily at the isostatic point. So we've moved off the isostatic point a bit, and we're looking now at properties in these last few minutes of any lattice with a global instability. And it turns out that knowing that a lattice has a global instability is actually going to tell us quite a bit about its long wavelength acoustic modes as well. So the first thing we want to do is characterize this instability. So I can think of some angle of data, like an angle between the lattice vectors, and I can look at the infinitesimal strain associated with the mode. So if I transform lattice a little, I'm straining it in each of the directions. That gives me a strain tensor, which has three independent components in 2D. So I can think of that strain tensor as a component of the angle of data that they're going through. And the strain tensor we have to be a little careful about because it's frame dependent. So what I really want to look at is the two invariance associated with it. The first one is its trace, and that just tells me how much the volume is changing. As we saw in the video, the volume, really the area of two dimensions, can change a great deal. And it's the second invariant that actually tells us the most. This is the determinant of the matrix, and we call that the dilational character. We call it that because this is positive if the strain in the two directions multiplied together is larger than the shear component squared. So if you have the Cagliari lattice, as you expand it, you can be in the dilation dominant regime. Where most of what you're doing is you're dilating it, you're not sharing it. And this is only possible for what we call oxidic materials, materials that uh, increase in the same direction. So if, you, if I pull it out up and down, it'll also expand left to right, whereas normal materials would contract to conserve their volume of it. The other regime is the more typical regime. It's true of anything that's non-oxidic and also even of some oxidic materials. It's where you have mostly shear components being dominant. So for the simple square lattice, it's in fact 100% shear uh, as we go through the whole motion. So now I want to come back to a point that we saw before that at first seems unrelated to this global instability. And this is the soft directions. So isostatic lattices can have soft directions in their long wavelength spectrum, where frequency goes like k squared rather than like k, which would be the normal thing. And as we saw, when we have five points, they come off of the soft direction. And it turns out also that when we have critical lines, so this is a critical line, it grows out of the soft direction. This is just the soft direction kept growing to cut across the whole lattice. So it turns out that all the topological properties we saw, all the ways of moving zero modes around, grew out of these soft directions. So now we want to figure out uh, somewhat relatedly, where these soft directions that give us these topological properties come from. And it turns out they come from the global mechanism. They come from the gas mode. So if I have a lattice with a global mechanism, not even not necessarily an isostatic lattice, it also has a rotation. You can always rotate a lattice without stretching any bonds. So what I have then is two ways of uniformly, uniformly straining the lattice without stretching any bonds. Now let's go back to my two soft modes. In the long wavelength limit, these are exactly zero frequency modes. And in the long wavelength limit, they're uniform modes. So what that means is they're a uniform strain mode that does not cost any energy and therefore does not stretch any bonds. So each of these two things is telling me that I have two modes that don't stretch any bonds. In fact, they're the same thing. If you look at the appendix of our paper, you can uh, see this mathematically, where if I give you the guess mode, you can tell me the two soft directions. And if you give me the two soft directions and you tell me, 
uh, what the amplitude of the phonon mode is along those, I can give you the guess mode. And it turns out then that whether we're shear dominant or dilation dominant will also tell us whether we have these soft modes in the bulk. If we're shear dominant and we solve, we get bulk soft modes. If we're dilation dominant, we can still solve, solve for soft modes, but they'll be at a complex wave number which means that they decay, which means that they're on the edge. So let's go back to our edge modes, so I run out of time. And uh, in the dilation dominant, we have soft modes on the edge. So our penetration depth for edge modes is proportionate to their wavelength, which is the same thing you have in Raleigh waves, which is pretty typical. So kappa y is linear in kx. For the shear dominant, the edge modes have penetration depth wavelength squared which means the long wavelength limit, they essentially enter the bulk. They essentially don't decay at all. So as I move between the dilation dominant and the shear dominant regimes, I go from having zero modes that lie on the edge of the long wavelength limit to ones that have actuated the bulk. So how do we activate this global mechanism? It turns out it's very easy. What we saw in the video is that if we control the boundary, such as with simple metal rods, we can just pull on the boundary. But also, we're changing everything about the structure of the lattice. So anything really that couples to the lattice in any way is also going to couple to this guest mode. So it changes the volume. So if we change the pressure, it'll change this. It changes the phonon spectrum. So if we change the temperature, it'll change this. If, it, if there's a field that couples to the structure of the system, then controlling that field will allow us to control the guest mode. And the metal rods are a particularly convenient way of doing this because since the rods are straight, it forces the edge to stay in a straight line, which enforces the crystal in order. So this slide shows us what we're doing in the video, but all put together so I can point to it all at once. So this angle theta is the angle between the red triangle and the blue triangle, and we're going through the whole cycle. And remember, straight lines give us self stresses, which give us zero mode, which allow us to change the topological polarization. For the deformed pachyme, there are three directions. So there are three times we can do that. Three times we can change the topological polarization. They always occur in the shear dominant regime. So when we start off in the dilation dominant regime, the structure is changing, but the topological polarization is staying constant. We hit this point, we hit the first straight line. The topological polarization goes from zero to pointing in this direction. We keep going, we hit another change, it's pointing in this direction. We have another change, it has to come back to zero where it started. So this is what we're doing. We're topologically polarizing the lattice without adding or removing or stretching any bond. We're just twisting the thing so we get straight lines, which destroys the bulk insulating state. And again, insulating state in the mechanical context means bulk rigidity. So what we saw when I poked on it is that that made the edge significantly stiffer. Before it completely crumpled when I pushed on it, that time it was enough to actually support its own weight so I could slide that, uh, you know, those few hundred tiny plastic pieces across the cable. So what we're doing is, again, we're taking that zero mode. As we change the angle, we're pushing the zero mode into the bulk. Now those red lines representing the zero mode don't decay. Instead, they spread across. And if we keep going, they move it to the opposite side. And again, we have this lattice with zero modes on the top, but no zero modes left on the bottom. So if I measure the edge stiffness, and this is a simulation of a 60 by 60 lattice, where I just take a lattice like this, and I do the same thing I did with my finger, which is I push in with this, and I measure the energy that the lattice takes. I let it relax. What I find is that when there are zero modes on the edge, the edge stiffness is essentially zero. This is 10 to the negative 9 in units of the spring strength. But when I go and hit the topological polarization, on the hard edge, the one that's losing the zero modes, it shoots up. It shoots up to around one. So what I've done is I've created a way of going from essentially zero stiffness to a finite stiffness that's given by the stiffness of these springs here. And in a real material, remember, we can have some resistance at the hinges. They aren't quite free hinges. So what this really is doing is flipping between the situation where the edge stiffness is given by however strong the hinge is to however strong the central forces are. And the soft edge never does much except at one particular angle, which corresponds to the whole thing completely topped. And that's, that's a fine-tuning effect that isn't topologically protected. So there are lots of ways we can make these. I, I showed you a couple of them already, but we're working with some chemical engineers. 
engineers to 3D print. Again, there are self-assembly methods. We're looking at another self-assembly method here using capillary forces. Uh, and these are deformed triangle cutouts. So these will allow us to create a deformed cabinet lattice. Uh, we're still working on actually realizing lattice with these. And again, you can do lots of macro scale things uh, like origami structures. So very briefly, I'm over time already. You cut me off. You must. But I want to talk about what this is useful for. So think a little bit about what this is. What this is is a material that exists mostly in our minds right now. But you can think of actually building this material down to the micro scale. And what I have then is something where I can hold in my hand and ask you to press on it. And what you feel is something that is hard. That if it's if it's plastic, it's as hard as plastic. And then if I keep pressing on it and I undergo an invisible topological polarization, you press on the same edge and suddenly it's gone completely soft. It completely moves out of your way. There's no resistance. So you have something where you can turn edge stiffness on and off repeatedly uh, without even applying any excess force, without uh, pressurizing a tube. Um, so th this I think is useful potentially for shoes, tires, for any sort of material for the whole of the vehicle where you want different levels of hardness and stiffness. Uh, so if you have a bicycle again, you want to have uh, thin tires for biking on roads, you want to have thick tires for biking on sand or here snow, but sometimes you're stuck with thin tires on sand or thick tires on the road. So you'd like to have a material that could actually switch to respond to environmental conditions. Uh, and when you're talking about a material that changes, adjusts to its environmental conditions, that makes you think of living material. And it's well known that biological materials care a great deal about the stiffness of the materials that they interact with. So there's a famous experiment where it was shown that if you take a stem cell and you put it on a substrate, it'll actually form a different type of cell depending on what substrate it's on. If it's on a hard cell, it thinks it's on bone. So it says, oh, it should be a bone cell. Softer, it could be muscle cell. Softer, heart cell. Softer, neuron cell. So it's going strictly off of how stiff the material is interacting with is. And if you have a lot of cells um, on the substrate that actually interact with each other through the substrate, they can feel themselves uh, like a spider feels a fly touching its web through the substrate. So they actually interact with each other differently and find each other differently over long different distances depending on the stiffness of the substrate. So right now people look at this with uh, micro pillars of different lengths to get substrates of different uh, stiffnesses, if you had something like this transformable topological mechanical bed material, you could actually change the stiffness in real time and watch how the cells respond. You could actually talk to the cells in the language of stiffness. So there are lots of things we can keep looking at, lots of things we are looking at. We can look at the full nonlinear regime. So I've shown you a couple nonlinear modes, but if you cut out the lattice, you have a full menu of nonlinear modes from each bond you cut out the Lattice, so you have this large zero energy manifold. It's a nonlinear object embedded in a larger space. Um, and we can look at the full way of looking at ways of building mechanisms into it. We can look at higher dimensions and more complicated structures. And we can look at thermal fluctuations. So we can look at what happens when the bonds are vibrating. And what you find is that your zero energy mode is no longer a zero free energy mode. So you find that there are certain configurations of the lattice that are preferred by thermal fluctuations. Thermal fluctuations can drive it into certain orientations and give it an entropic rigidity. We've looked at ways to create bulk topological mode. And we've looked at ways of using the global instability to change the topological polarization. Thank you very much. Sorry for going on. I'd like to understand this notion of topological uh, polarization there. If, if, you, if you look uh, at the electronic problem, you know, Sue Schrieffer Deger model, uh, so there, if you have some kind of uh, domain wall, yep. uh, you talk about polarization in terms of transporting an electron charge across the Bruin zone. So in, in, in this mechanical world, um, is, there, is there a similar way of understanding this polarization? Does it correspond to uh, transporting some kind of uh, 
a topological charge across some characteristic distance? Yeah, so uh, people are going to think you're a plant, because that's, that's the one question I have an answer for in the form of a toy in my bag. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, so there's a, in the Sushri for Heater model, there's a mobile domain wall between uh, different domains of different topological polarizations that's a solid time. And you have exactly the same thing in the mechanical setting. So this is an example of a nonlinear thing that we're looking at. This is a nonlinear model. So when they first looked at this system, they just found the two topological polarizations. And then uh, Vincenzo Vitelli and Brian Chen and Nitin uh looked at the nonlinear stuff. And what they found is that if you have another system of corner sharing triangles, you can find that one side is floppy, one side is hard. So this is the topological polarization where it's going like this. But if I push on that floppy mode and I keep going, it's hard to see, but it turns into a soliton and actually carries the motion across the lattice until now I've gone the other way. So now that the floppy mode is entirely on this side and it's not at all on this side. Um, so this is a nonlinear effect. So when they looked at the origami lattice, the origami lattice, the 1D origami chain, is the same to linear order, but it turns out when you try to do the same thing with the origami lattice, you can't. You, you pull on this and you excite the mode, but it never leaves the bad boundary. So you need to look at the full nonlinear problem, but if you do, um, there is a mechanical lattice that is equivalent to the Sutri for Heger model, even to nonlinear order. I have a question for the model. You're showing the graph that you have a wave number with KY. Thank you. 